Oh, I was muted. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, Gary. <laughs> Sorry about that. No problem. You're online. Well, after, after me is Dr. Vargas, right? So I yes. I'll turn it over to Dr. Vargas. Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to look at a, a document that Mario sent me just so I could quickly set up the streaming on Facebook Live as well. Last eight minutes we have. Great, do you ever age? Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> like a vampire. <laughs> I'm okay. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> we, we all look the same. Yep. <laughs> we keep telling ourselves that. That's <laughs> right. We're, we're just simply grown up children. <laughs> <laughs> George, it's good to see you. Keep yeah, dancing, I know. My friend. Long time no see. I miss my friends in Corpus Christi and Indeed. all the gang in South Texas. No oh, sure. But this is a this is a good way by which we can reconnect. I agree. And uh, knock on wood, we we uh, hope to have this show travel to Corpus Christi at the Art Museum. Oh. Yay! Great. Or uh, next year. Fantastic. Yes. We're working with Deborah Fullerton over there to see if we can make the make the magic happen in Corpus Christi as well. Fantastic show. That would be wonderful. That would be wonderful. Indeed. Jerry, how's Caitlin? Good. Good. Yeah. We're doing good. Yeah. It's uh it's a little smoky here. Uh, <laughs> oh. But uh of course. It looks good right now. Hey, Jerry. Emily, Emily was here yesterday. Oh, great. Yeah, that's my mom's sister. Yes, uh, she thoroughly enjoyed the show. I spent a number of good quality time with her and she purchased some books from us. So she was really delighted by the show. Very, very excited and very pleased by what she saw. Great. Thank you. I recognize a couple of those pieces behind you, Trey. How about, how about <laughs> this one? <laughs> <laughs> you see that? Uh, that goes back. There's one of Betty's behind you too. Look at that. Uh, yeah, right here. Wow. <laughs> There's a Bruno. There's a Bruno. I got an Oscar. Oscars, yeah. <laughs> I spoke with him recently. Oh yeah. Yeah. Just wanted to see how he was doing. He's doing well. <laughs> Five minutes to Sylvia's on the move. <laughs> Look at that. <clears throat> Never sitting. <laughs> no. My apologies, since we do have five minutes, everybody. Do you mind if I just make sure I'm going to share? No, my... by all means, this is why we're here. Yeah, okay. Practice. This is why we're here. I just want to make sure. Anybody needs a water break, bathroom break, by all means. Everybody can see that? Yes. Okay. Looks good. Thank you much. I also previewed it uh, this week and I thought it looked fantastic beginning to end. Well, thank you. Well, I added some additional images in there just to- uh, Oh, good. As well. So I'm really interested on in your dialogue to see where we're going with this uh, presentation. The visuals are, are outstanding. Trey, I'm gonna be uh, uh, showing some of a uh, your father's uh, most memorable quotes. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> Such as, push it. <laughs> and a few others that I remember uh, writing down that we still talk about. Perfect. <laughs> and then what, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show an image of mine, which I, I, I was a little unhesitant hesitant about doing so because I felt a little self-serving, but wasn't trying to do that, just trying to take his advice, can sure. apply to the work, you know, but just one quick image and then show multitude of student work that has been, uh, that's resulted from his sure. yeah. advice. So. That's great. Thank you. Now, sometimes we have to beat our own drum, Trey, and uh, <laughs> oh, and, and uh, carry. If no one else does it, we beat our own drums. That's true. Sorry, I'm just putting my stuff down.
I was about to spray some banaca in my mouth, but <laughs> what's the point of that? <laughs> That's a uh, classic Joe right there. Yeah. <laughs> Anything. It's going to make the room smell better. Not so coffeeish. Coffeeish, is that a word? I don't know. I'm going to own it. It's mine. Yeah. Copyright. Sylvia, we, I can't hear you. We're practicing. Oh, okay, just make sure. <laughs> Who is that? That's Joe. Oh, hey, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Here. Wait, say it again. Oh, okay. He didn't hear you. Okay. No, I heard. <laughs> Ari, I remember you had said you maybe had some video of Bruno. Oh, you're on mute. They went back through the whole thing, and I'll go through it one more time, but it looks like it was that Hispanic art historian that taught at the university for a while. And I'm trying to think of his name. He lives in California now. Uh, Ramon Favela, they think that. Oh, that's sure. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sure. Very well known. Uh, so, artist. I'm sorry. <laughs> I misled you. <laughs> oh, it's video of him? It's video of when they installed uh, that work from the um, uh, NEA that's in mm -hmm. the Corpus Christi piece that's in the lobby there. And I think your dad was instrumental in getting that grant, but for some reason, whoever watched it said, no, it's somebody else. But I'm going to look at it again, because I, I do have a copy of it. And if it appears to be Bruno to me, I will send it to you. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't think it is. So. Gotcha. It's really hard to hear the audio in it. So it, it's, um, you know, it's really a bad take. So it sounds like he's saying um, the other name. Hmm. Is it on a VHS tape? It was. I have it on a, a CD. Do you have anything that plays CDs there? <laughs> sure. Okay, I'll send it to you. <laughs> My computer doesn't play CDs anymore. <laughs> Okay, so I'm about to start broadcasting in about a minute or about a few seconds. Uh, and yeah, I'm just going to basically introduce the program. <clears throat> I'm going to start with introductions and just to not go over it uh, three times, we'll, we'll, we'll just get started now. All right. Okay, so hello, uh, good morning, welcome to everyone. My name is Jose Martinez and I'm education associate at the Mexicarte Museum. And joining me today on the Bruno Andrade uh, panel discussion lectures where I have uh, Silvia Orozco, who's gonna be, who's the executive director of the museum. She's gonna be doing an introduction um, and I'm gonna go ahead and hand over the mic to her. Welcome to Mexicarte Museum, and welcome uh, to our panel discussion today that we're having. The Bruno Andrade Retrospective, a native of South Texas, filled the walls of the museum this year during the one, of, one of the most difficult times 
uh, in our history. The exhibition brought purpose and strength to our organization. For the public, we hope that the Bruno Andrade artwork filled and enlightened your lives and our community's lives at the museum and through our virtual programming. The retrospective exhibition features the work of Bruno Andrade, not only an important Latino artist, but an important American artist. Bruno was a friend of the museum. He participated in several of Mexicartes exhibitions in the 1990s, and he is represented in our permanent collection. Mexicarte Museum expresses our sincere gratitude to Trey Andrade for the opportunity and support to present this exhibition and to honor the artistic contributions of Bruno Andrade. We acknowledge and thank the lenders of art to this exhibition, the Bruno Andrade Estate, Peter Arnold, Luis Corpus, Celso Gonzalez Faya, Sandra Hillman, Jack and Molly Maudesset, Joe Pena, Rolando Reina, Tinker Tromley, Dr. George Vargas. Special thanks to Luis Corpos and Gina Atbos at the South Texas College in McAllen, Texas, who this year organized also the exhibition, Bruno Andrade, Legacy of an Artist Educator. We thank the general, generous sponsors of the exhibition, the City of Austin Cultural Arts Division, the Texas Humanities for the Arts, the Brown Foundation, and HEB who made this exhibition possible. And we thank the Texas Humanities, Humanities Texas for sponsoring this panel discussion. I would like to thank and acknowledge the work of the Mexicarte team in producing this incredible exhibition, a retrospective of Bruno Andrade. For, for, for co-curating the exhibition, Dr. George Vargas, for the design and installation, Andrew Anderson, Savannah Diaz, Michael Robles, Sarah Palma. For compiling and organizing the object labels, Amber Amisquita and Reina Gonzalez. For the creation and design of the education programs, Jose Martinez, Nikki Diaz, Paulina Docel Terminal. For the tours, Elsa Diaz and Laura Carizosa. For gardening sponsorship, promotion, and membership, Danielle Hoots Cooper, Mario Villanueva, and Gabriela Garza. For the visitor services, Nicole Palantir and Juanita Martinez. It was a big effort, and you saw all the one, all the staff did their best and their most best in presenting this professional and important exhibition. Lastly, I want to emphasize the importance of Bruno as an artist and an educator. We hope this exhibition assists in documenting his legacy, his contributions to the world of art, and will continue to inspire young artists. Please enjoy the panel discussion. And now I turn it over to Dr. George Vargas, our curator. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. I appreciate your introduction. We want to invite questions and comments and we'll, add, we'll look at those uh, after the presenters uh, give their lectures. I also want to uh, take the time to thank Silvio Orozco, as well as this museum, for giving me the opportunity to help to organize the exhibition and to help to write the, the, uh, the catalog, a first time uh, historic event uh, regarding the virtual exhibition, as well as a virtual catalog. I am both honored and humbled by this experience. Having said that, let me now begin the program. I want to introduce our first lecturer, the son of Bruno Andrade. He studied color theory with his father at a and University in Corpus Christi. He also uh, taught for um, a short tenure, sharing his knowledge and experience of art and color. Presently, he is a color engineer. He will be talking about Bruno Andrade, the color theory of Bruno Andrade. That is, we introduce now Trey Andrade. Welcome, Trey Andrade. Hello. Hi, everybody. I'm going to share my screen. OK, 
I'd like to thank uh, Sylvia and the museum for all the amazing work that you've done. This has been going on for a, a, about a year now, um, working on this show. I think, you know, I wish we could all be there together, but um, I'm glad that um, we can share this time now. Can everybody see my screen? Do you see just the slideshow? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right, so I'd like to focus on um, his creative process. We will go in and talk about color, but um, I just thought, um, you know, from an early age, I had the opportunity to sit in his studio and, you know, roll around on the ground and, and watch as he created these pieces from um, just an idea all the way into, you know, a, a, these bigger than life paintings. Um, so this is a quote from him. As in nature, I would hope my art communicates pleasure and serenity, inviting the viewer into a world of wonder. These are um, two of his uh, main influences. I was going to go through you know, influence, inspiration, drawing, and then go into color. Um, these two artists, Hans Hoffman and, and Matisse, um, were very uh, instrumental in his ideology. Um, these, they were also actually friends uh, and painted together in Paris in the 1910s. But um, they each also shared um, this idea of kind of the spirit of a painting, which uh, Bruno also really connected with. And we'll talk more about these artists uh, in a little bit. Um, so for his inspiration, he lived in Corpus Christi and Flower Bluff. And uh, he would pull from that landscape. Um, these are, he could just walk across the street from his house and go into this, you know, other world. Um, and although I think uh, George had mentioned before, he, he wouldn't typically paint out in the landscape. It was more, I think, to collect ideas. Um, and I, I think the lines and uh, of the landscape specifically influenced his drawing. I'm looking at these mesquite trees and these kind of whimsical lines that they make. Uh, I think that was a big inspiration. So going into drawing, this uh, drawing on the left is an earlier drawing from um, 19, actually I think it's 1980s, and then the one on the right is from 2010. And you can kind of see a progression here of on the left, this more whimsical, an, another world, and then going to the image on the right, um, later in life, uh, more structure. <laughs> he is uh, drawing out the ratios for, you know, two inches equals one foot and getting real meticulous with how he was going to plan this piece. Um, and these drawings are, they're small. And so, you know, you're using the wrist to make these, these spaces but then you've, you've got to translate that much bigger. And um, he had a big laugh and a big smile and he made big paintings. Um, he was a bodybuilder for many years. And, uh, but it would all start with these small drawings, you know, in a sketchbook. And uh, this was a thought that he would tell his, you know, his students, you know, the importance of your sketchbook. And, um, that, that drawing is thinking, and um, it all starts with an idea. So these are these small ideas that would blossom into these larger works. Um, I thought this was a really good example of how he would isolate the drawing. So you've got the drawing on the right, which is very small, and then was translated to this you know, six foot painting. Um, Specifically here, he is eliminating the need to continue to think about the drawing. So as the drawing on the right looks so much like the painting, he would bring that drawing to the canvas and then he could focus on color. And going back to, um, I, I think it's in the next slide, but the way that this is something with Hans Hoffman, um, this push-pull, where typically a blue, a deep blue, would recede into um, 
recede into space and, and these bright reds will, will come forward. And you can see in this piece on the, on the left, he was really trying to play with this, um, with this uh, juxtaposition of, of color so that you, know, the, you have this strong blue right here in the front and the green behind it is setting it off to, to push it forward. And, and then you've got this little touch of red over on the left and all of the little touch in the top on the tree. And it's all just kind of playing around and activating the entire space um, of this piece. So by getting the drawing done, he was able to focus on those colors and how they play off one another. Um, so this is going into that a little bit more. Uh, this Hans Hoffman piece again on the right. Uh, push and pull, these movements are caused by form and color on a bare canvas, which creates the combined effect of two and three dimensionality. The image is two dimensional, but in this activation of push and pull, it and then compounded with the observer uh, observing the piece, it then creates this three dimensionality. Um, the observer bringing their past experiences to the piece, as well as the activation of the color. Um, I just pulled this uh, Hans Hoffman piece off the internet um, almost randomly, but when I put it up against this Bruno piece on the left, these yellows where you've got, you know, this yellow here and here and here, activating different corners of the image, uh, almost mimicking the, the Hoffman on the right. And um, also the blues, you know, here and here and here, moving the piece, um, you know, in and out, taking the viewer into the space, back out of the space. Um, trees are overlapping in ways that maybe don't make sense. <laughs> it's kind of playing with this whimsical nature um, that Bruno really, you know, I think, enjoyed um, in the space so that it's not, um, you know, photographic representation, it's, it's more emotional, um, his maybe a memory of a space that he's then reactivating with color. Um, this is a piece um, in the show and um, another example of how color can defy um, maybe what makes sense. The, the blue in the table and the blue of the ocean are kind of uniting, bringing the inside of the home into the outside. Uh, there's also another combination going on here. He, um, you know, he lived in Corpus Christi, but he had a, a gallery in New York for many years. And these trees, these evergreen trees, you, you would never see those in Corpus. Those are definitely from, uh, you know, upstate New York. And that influence there is also from uh, Fairfield Porter and um, but then the roses were actually from Corpus Christi and so there you have you know maybe his heart is in in Texas but he was looking to you know grow his career and his future uh, in New York and took a lot of inspiration from that whole experience uh, but he would still go back and forth you know he'd go from New York to Corpus and here we have that experience, that combination in a piece. Um, and then over here on the right, this Matisse, you know, playing with similar motifs of out the window, in the home. Uh, it almost looks like the plants are taking over this red room. Um, it's, you know, the, in, uh, the, the duality of, of humans uh, that we, we, we bring nature into our home. And uh, we, yeah, we still have this window out, you know, framing nature um, out the window. I thought this was a nice quote from Matisse, uh, derive happiness in oneself from a good day's work, from illu illuminating the fog that surrounds us. I thought that was uh, particularly important right now, you know, in our, our current time. Uh, and here's just a couple pictures of Bruno. I wanted to share my, my mother sent this piece on the left yesterday, this uh, photograph that was, uh, I, there was a painting that actually him and I did and I couldn't find a picture of it. And uh, I think I was about that, that old and he had me do the little, uh, little dots, red dots on the trees. Um, I, I think it, that piece might be in Austin. 
Um, so, and then over here on the right is Bruno. Um, and I think this photo was taken for the New Yorker in the 90s and his, you know, huge paintings. Uh, <laughs> um, and yeah, that was in his studio in, in Corpus. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's what I've got here. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share some Bruno uh, knowledge and uh, uh, we can answer any questions, I guess, uh, at the end. <clears throat> so yeah, uh, with, that, with that point, we are gonna be taking, uh, if you guys have any questions or comments that you wanna ask Trey, you know, being the son of Bruno growing up, watching his process and color theory and seeing how color theory influences work and all that. We're going to be taking, uh, having a Q&A section towards the, the end of the discussion. This will be about 12.40 to 1. We'll, we'll take 20 minutes to get any questions. Uh, so if you guys want to submit the questions while they're occurring, you can do that too. And then I'll be basically redirecting them to whoever their, the question is assigned to. So be thinking about that. So thank you very much, Trey, for um, the color theory of Bruno Andrade. Um, and then you know, if Dr. Vargas, you want to introduce the next panelist. For presentation, thank you for sharing your memories, uh, Bruno Andrade, and especially uh, the, his, your insights as regards uh, color theory. A very uh, moving presentation as you explained your relationship to, uh, to Bruno. Of course, we forget that he was uh, a father uh, to you. Our next presenter is a professor of art that is painting at a &M University in Corpus Christi. He was the mentee to the mentor, Bruno Andrade. Uh, Joe Pena is now a professor of painting in a position that was uh, vacated by Bruno Andrade upon his death. Joe Pena will be talking about the legacy of Bruno Andrade as artist, educator. Thank you, George. Welcome, everybody. Thank you, George. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us for this uh, momentous event. Uh, first of all, I do want to uh, acknowledge uh, Silvio Orozco, Executive Director at the Mexi Arte Museum, for having the vision to undertake such a daunting task of organizing this exhibition. Especially during these uncertain times, it's encouraging to see those who have the tenacity to insist that literally the show must go on. Uh, your commitment to the arts has always been and still is remarkable. I also want to thank uh, Dr. George Vargas, a Curator of Exhibitions at the Museum, uh, for his dedication to the museum. Uh, George has always been a good friend and consummate professional. Upon hearing of his involvement in the exhibition as well, I knew that it would be even in further good hands. I also wish to acknowledge the assistance of Jose uh, and Mario there at the museum, as well as the rest of the staff for their tireless work in this project. I also want to thank my colleague, Dr. Kerry Rote, art historian at Texas A&M University Corpus Christi, for her endearing friendship with Bruno and mine, of course, and her continued guidance and support. He always spoke so highly of you, Carrie, and it's a pleasure to be a part of this with you. Uh, most of all, I wish to thank Bruno's son, Trey, for allowing the rest of us to continue to relish in the work of your father. Uh, your commitment to ensuring that his legacy as a great artist and a great man not be forgotten is what every father, including myself, would hope for. Bruno would be so proud. Thank you, Trey. Uh, so now onto my presentation, which I've decided uh, to break up into three parts. The first will be a selection of quotes from important people in the art world who knew Bruno well, and as well include selections from critical reviews from exhibitions. Uh, the second will be a selection of statements or quotes, if you will, from Bruno that I remember as a young art student that I continue to share with my own students. And the third will be a selection of some of my favorite photos of Bruno with family and friends. Excuse me. First, the paintings. Uh, this will be the only other solo image of another person that I will include in the exhibition, or rather the presentation, excuse me. Uh, but this is of Dr. 
John Driscoll, uh, who passed away uh, in March of COVID-19. And John was a the director of Babcock Galleries in New York, uh, which uh, then went on to become Driscoll Babcock. Uh, John and Bruno were very good friends. And I worked with John Driscoll for approximately five years in New York City after uh, the, uh, the gallery MB Modern had closed down or rather moved its operation to Houston permanently. Uh, but John was a, a consummate uh, professional, a good friend to everyone, a, a wonderful gallery director, a uh, collector, just an enthusiast of the arts and the art world lost a, uh, someone tragic from this terrible virus that's going on. But I do wanna share some comments uh, from Dr. John Driscoll. By the way, jo uh, Dr. Driscoll also wrote uh, the wonderful book, Bruno Andrade, The Nature I Paint, um, which features Bruno. He was a realist with a refined sense of abstraction, a subtle colorist with a boisterous use of hues and a sophisticated painter inoculated with the wonder of an eccentric visionary. You can see that with the power of what Bruno was able to capture in his work. On a personal note, some of the comments that I uh, chose from Bruno was, on first meeting, Andrade's massive Diego Rivera-like form and quick motion suggest a bruising, crushing middle linebacker. As Trey had mentioned, he was a, uh, a bodybuilder and just as massive a human being. However, his genial smile and ready to laugh reveal a friendly and joyous nature that would put any former quarterback at ease. Um, John also went on to say, Bruno was a grand and noble person, a brilliant artist, a caring and constant friend. With art, he was bewilderingly sophisticated. He could do anything with a brush and paint. And again, that's obvious and evident in the work um, of Bruno Andrade. He could literally do anything with a brush and paint. And to have that much control and to have that much access to that control at every work uh, was remarkable to see. This is the quote, a quote rather from uh, Lewis Newman, former director of the MB Modern Gallery in New York, current director of modernism at Lou Allen Galleries in Santa Fe. Uh, knowing Bruno was a, to know his art and vice versa. Bruno's personality was consistently reflected in his joy-filled and exuberant works. Paintings like Bruno were thoughtful, colorful, and emotionally connected. Uh, Lewis, uh, still to this day, speaks very fondly of his time with Bruno. And uh, it's wonderful uh, that Bruno's uh, inflection uh, and joyous nature still is present and evident. This is from Michael Lathrop. Michael Lathrop was a good friend of Bruno's as well as the uh, gallery owner of MB Modern in New York and a wonderful painter himself. And Bruno was a master of color with, with a refined eye for nature and all of its surroundings. Uh, Michael so relishes in all of the time that he spent with Bruno, uh, both there in the gallery and outside of the gallery. Uh, they had so many good times together, both uh, out in the world as well as in the studio. And there were times I could have sworn that each of them would feed off each other in terms of uh, placement of color and placement of certain uh, or rather compositions. And so it was wonderful to see that friendship. This is from Alan Gussell, the noted artist and educator. Bruno Andrade's extraordinary sense of color allows him to create evocative landscapes with a deep South Texas accent. Um, uh, Alan, was invited by Bruno to come down and visit South Texas, of which he did, and just walked away this wonderful, with this wonderful sense of what Texas, especially South Texas, had done for Bruno's work. This is from, again, the noted artist and educator, Emily Mason, who is the wife of Wolf Kahn. Uh, Emily Mason actually also studied with uh, Hans Hoffman, and they would have numerous discussions about Hoffman's influence. 
and Emily writes, Bruno Andrade's work has a charming naivete. It is always engaging for his imagery and delightful color. She was a regular uh, staple of the gallery in New York and it was wonderful to see her and Bruno have numerous discussions. But you can see what she's referring to, to his brilliant use of color in this piece. Well, what am I talking about? In all of them, really. <laughs> Here are a few selection of reviews that I thought were important. This is from Charles D. Mitchell from Art Forum. Easy manner and unapologetic gorgeousness of Andrade's work, a life that he celebrates in these unabashedly beautiful paintings. The power of the paint, as I like to call it. This is from the noted critic, Jamie James from The New Yorker. The most cheerful painting in show, full naive floral still lives with pronounced echoes of Matisse drawn on the gaudy palette of a Mexican border town. Uh, John Drisco particularly liked this uh, quote uh, because he loved the element of the, of the notion of the gaudy palette of a Mexican border town and then Bruno's kind of relish in that just uh, vibrance in it. And so he loved this quote quite a bit. This is from the critic Peter Denoli uh, from New York Arts. Bruno Andrade's work are a delightful excursion with postmodernist energy and intelligent, pretentious manipulation of surface and dimension, imagery, color, and empirical color. Kay Larson from the Village Voice writes, the references to Matisse, Matisse excuse me, are not casual, but deeply felt Andrade's work is pure painting. So now I want to get onto the portion where I share some of quotes from Bruno uh, taken from class from uh, when I was a young art student and some of the quotes that we still share among some of uh, uh, Bruno's uh, continued uh, uh, devotees, if you will. Um, not much unlike Robert Henry's uh, book, The Art Spirit, uh, Bruno had a wonderful sense of uh, delivering these wonderful quotes uh, that would inspire you uh, while you're in your studio, while you were in the studio. One of my favorites, and as well as with a number of others, is push it. And you would hear that quite a bit. And he would just look at you and say, why aren't you pushing it? Push it, you know? And he would come up and you would say, uh, almost as if you, when you're presenting your piece for crit critique, and almost as if to go into a third state and go up to somebody else and talk to them and say, why isn't he pushing it? Who, you know, look, look at that, why isn't he pushing it? And I remember those days all too often. And so when he would just go from person to person and say, what's, what's he doing over there? Why isn't he pushing it? What's wrong with him, you know? And boy, it got you motivated, you know? So what I wanted to do is just to briefly show you a work where I would, of mine, uh, of various elements where I would actually share a, uh, I take that notion of what Bruno was talking about and kind of infuse it in my own work. And this is in no ways meant to be self-serving, but more so uh, how uh, important his uh, knowledge and his voice still carried on. Here's an image of Bruno uh, in the studios with students. And again, you can almost see him saying, why isn't she pushing it? What's wrong with it? <laughs> that is Carolyn Young. I'm not sure who the other person is. Again, Bruno, he knew how to push it. <laughs> this was a work that I did uh, with my students in which um, I would paint a portrait. And, I, and when I would constantly tell the students, you know, push it, you got to push the work, just as Bruno would say, push it. And they would say, well, you just did a portrait. Why, how can you push that? And so as a challenge, I then took it out and shot it with a shotgun to see what would happen. And, uh, and we all did a, a, a fun little project with that where we would say, well, let's make a portrait, a formal portrait of some sort, and let's see how far we can push that. And we got some really interesting results. Um, I don't have those, all of those here with me, but I'll show you some of those. Um, this is a student of mine who took his words all too, uh, all too serious, pushing it even further, much more than just the mundane. I had one student uh, who did this wonderful self-portrait 
and again echoing the words of uh, push it decided to just pour a solvent on top to see what would happen as i always like to say in my studio uh, in the classroom um, it's only paint do it again you can do it once you can do it again so why aren't you pushing it this is from one of my uh, graduate students who just decided again, take it one step further. Another quote that I remember Bruno saying was, don't be afraid of color. It can do more for, for you than you can imagine. And of course you see that in his own work. Uh, Trey, I hope you don't mind, but I use this image of yours again. <laughs> uh, it's one of my favorite. But you can see it in his work in the back of his studio there. This notion of just applying color to the most, to, to, to what you can do with it. Do not be afraid. And I take a, just a very side note of some of my own, uh, an image of my own, of even not only the kind of loud, uh, vibrant colors, but also the subtle uh, colors that can be used in your work too. It's most, uh, most evident. I, I hear Bruno's words quite a bit. And my students were, who would say, uh, you know, just this notion of just, what else can you do with color? How far can you push it? What else can you do? Again, I think this student took it all too serious. <laughs> Nature can teach, teach us so much, learn from it. And as Trey had mentioned, Bruno was uh, always uh, taking inspiration from nature. And when you tell us that in the classroom, you would tell us that you know, to, to embrace nature in, in, in all of its form, and not necessarily only the landscape and the other formats as well. How else can you learn from it? What else can you do with it? Here's an image of Bruno uh, in the landscape, making sketches for upcoming work. One of my favorites. And you can see that intense, that intensity, if you will, uh, of the inspiration from the landscape, from the landscape. This is one of my students who embraced the landscape. Another student. And one of the things that I do remember Bruno saying was the, uh, the power of nature. And I, uh, in dispelling Bruno's continued in, uh, knowledge onto the students, uh, the student came up with this, this notion of this, um, or this landscape, the breaking waves again, this notion of this, the power of nature, of what it can do. And a student who in, took inspiration from nature in other ways as well. and one who embedded nature into, uh, into her work in subtle ways. She was one that was always looking at the book that I have of Bruno's out, uh, always looking through that for inspiration as well. Not all work has to be loud. There can be power in the quiet. And as vibrant and as colorful as Bruno's works were, um, there was a uh, a, a, a quiet in some of them, a, a contemplation, if you will. And I take those words to, into my own work that subtle quiet, uh, subtlety, quiet uh, can be powerful instruments in the studio. This is a work of a student of mine. Not all work has to be loud. There can be power in the quiet. Another current student.
Be spontaneous, you would say at times. Also, every mark counts. You know, don't be afraid of, of that brush, you know. I love this image I wanted to share uh, in, as, uh, in all of his seriousness that he would bring into the, uh, uh, into the classroom. Um, at times, he was also just this joyous uh, power of nature, if you will. One of my favorites. But uh, you can see where uh, in this painting, for example, where you would see the spon spontaneous application of marks in certain areas uh, to bring, uh, to bring a, a, a vibrance to the work. This was a work of mine where I took his words all too serious and just let uh, be spontaneous. I wanted to include this one from a graduate student, former graduate student of one of mine who, um, who couldn't figure out what to do with the composition. And after she painted a portrait of her brother, which was on the left hand side, and so I kind of echoed Bruno's words in terms of be spontaneous. What, what, what can you do with that? And so she decided to echo the, uh, the image of her brothers, of her brother, excuse me, in the same composition and creating a really unusual piece that I thought was really wonderful. By the way, this is one of those images uh, that goes back to um, when I challenge my students to create a formal portrait and then do something with it, challenge it, push it. Sometimes you have to let the brush do what it wants to do. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, and as much control uh, that Bruno had over uh, his materials, and he had uh, this wonderful sense of um, power that he could do. And you could see it in all of his work where he was, had the control of being able to apply um, the smooth gradations of application of color. And then all of a sudden, as evident in the landscape of above, or rather the sky, we're all of a sudden being able to switch on a dime to these incredible, powerful marks. Uh, that was just wonderful. So the ability to sometimes letting the brush um, be calm and then sometimes just letting it be energizing, letting it do what it wants to do. Here's a work of mine where I took that. And some of my students. Letting the materials do what it wants. The simple can be beautiful, was one of my favorite quotes that he would tell me. It doesn't always have to have this, this, this enormous concept behind it, you know, that sometimes the most simple things can be uh, just beautiful. This was one of my favorite photos of Bruno. Here's some student work, taking Bruno's advice. So I would like to share with you some uh, favorite photos of mine uh, that, that I have in my collection and beginning, of course, with a wonderful image of Bruno with Trey. Look at that. <laughs> it's one of my favorite images. Um, such a wonderful uh, photo of Trey and Bruno. Here's a photo of Bruno uh, and his mother, Trey's grandmother, um, who I would uh, visit quite a bit. And when Bruno would get, uh, be on one of his excursions to, uh, uh, to New York City, as Trey had mentioned, I would go and make sure that she was doing well. Uh, she was a wonderful, wonderful person and so proud of her son and grandson. This is an image of Bruno in New York with uh, Barbara Gonzalez on the left-hand side, of course, Bruno. Uh, and this is uh, Sandra uh, Gilman, um, the noted collector and philanthropist, um, who was very good friends with Bruno and had a number of his works 
Uh, that peeking in the back is Michael Lathrop and another dear friend, Betty Mobley. Michael Grew and Betty would spend numerous, numerous uh, hours upon hours, rather, just speaking about art in Bruno's studio. This was a great image of, that I have of Bruno and Michael with uh, uh, the American painter, uh, Philip Perlstein. Uh, Philip was a constant guest in the gallery and they had numerous discussions about paint uh, and paint application, just uh, wonderful things. The last two photos are gonna be uh, uh, a couple of favorites of mine. This is, um, myself on the left-hand side, and this is Manuel Chapa, who is another, uh, who's a dear friend, another uh, dear friend of Bruno's, and Trey, uh, who's also a very uh, um, uh, instrumental in, in helping in the studio as well. And one of my favorite photos of Bruno and I, uh, with, a, with one of Bruno's cigars that he loved, and boy, uh, it was great to have those times and talk about art in the studio, smoking a cigar and having some a drink of Jack Daniels. Boy, uh, myself and Rolando Reina, another uh, artist and friend and associate uh, of Bruno's as well, uh, would have numerous times, uh, just wonderful times talking uh, with him during those times. Thank you, Bruno. I do appreciate everything that you've done and will continue to share uh, your, your knowledge to my students. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much, Professor Joe Pena, for that wonderful, intriguing presentation. We now turn to the anchor of our lectures. She is a professor of art history at AM University in Corpus Christi, an expert in pre Columbian Mesoamerican art, colonial art, Chicano art, and has a keen interest in the Virgen de Guadalupe. I present to you, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Kerry Rote, who will speak on the nature of color. Kerry. Thank you so much, George. Thank you, everyone. Uh, oops, wait. I'm trying to share my screen, but I'm not doing it right. Hold on. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> can you see me now? You can see my screen, right? Yes, we can see yep. it. Perfect. Okay. Um, so I kind of wrote this out, um, and my title of my paper is The Nature of Color and the Art of Bruno Andrade. But I will also maybe do some hand gestures. I wasn't sure if I would be shown here or if it would just be um, the slides, so I can kind of ad lib to this. I first met Bruno in the summer of 1987 when I was interviewing for the art history position at Corpus Christi State University, which is now known as Texas A&M University Corpus Christi. Bruno and I made an instant connection. We just clicked. In fact, close to the time of his death, he told me, Carrie, I think of you as my sister. And I have to tell you, he was my brother too. Um, in many ways, I was closer to him than to my own brothers. Throughout his tenure at TAMU CC, we were close friends and confidants. And believe me, you need that confidant in academia. <laughs> it comes in very handy. Um, part of our connection was our hometown of San Antonio. The following things that I'm going to tell you are highly personal and things that I don't normally brag or talk about, uh, being a rather uh, modest about my background. But I wanted to share this with you because this is part of what made our bond so great and so strong. We often talked about San Antonio, where Bruno had been a student at Thomas Jefferson High School, and he was a very active athlete. Uh, he was a member of the golf team. Uh, one of the stories he used to tell me was he would tell me, Carrie, you know, usually people with my color of skin cannot go to the country club, but because I play golf for Jefferson, I get to play at the San Antonio Country Club all the time. <laughs> so he was very proud of that aspect. And since he was interested in 
sports, um, he was aware of my father-in-law, Kyle Rote, who was also a Jefferson graduate in the 1940s. Um, and fortunately, while we were in New York, and I think Joe might have been there with us as well, he got to meet Kyle Rote. <laughs> so he got to meet his idol, uh, the New York Giants uh, football player, uh, Kyle. And having walked the same halls as Kyle, he was very happy about this. One of his favorite stories that Bruno often told me was that he had a personal connection to my mother's family. My mother is a member of the Maverick family of San Antonio. And he oftentimes would tell me a story that had been handed down to him by his father. And he, and like I said, the reason I do gestures is Bruno would do the gestures when he told me the story. So it kind of plays into it. Um, he said that his father, uh, Bruno the first, um, had worked for uh, Mayor Mari Maverick, who was my great uncle, when Mari was mayor of San Antonio. Bruno said his father's job during 1939 to 1941 was to go to the poker parties that Mayor Mari would have with other influential men in San Antonio. His job was to stand in the room above where the gentlemen were meeting, put alcohol, uh, I don't know if it was beer or, or whiskey, <laughs> into a bucket and then slowly lower that bucket down into the middle of the table. He could hear all kinds of activities going on in there and major decisions about the future of San Antonio being made in that particular room. And then at long last, Bruno met my mother, who you see here, and he became quite smitten with her. You can see how beautiful my mother was. And she was a very intellectual and intelligent woman, full of energy, generosity, and wit. She uh, really enjoyed a great friendship with Bruno until his untimely passing in 2013. There are many things that I would like to tell you about Bruno, about the nature of color, the love of nature, the nature and character of friendship. Bruno was a force of nature himself. He was full of life and his personality was bigger than life. He had a keen intellect and a warm heart. We had many great laughs together. Some of them are a little off color. I, I would tell one, but I don't know if I'd get in trouble. <laughs> um, we also shared a great uh, and a few sorrows as well. So we went through some hard times together and we stuck it out. Bruno was a consummate professional. He knew how to work as an artist professionally and he was diligent in training his students in how to do the subtle relationship building that is important in the art world. He would get his students dressed up in back black shirts and black pants, and they would work his parties. Uh, they would get paid. He wasn't uh, slave labor. Um, and they, they would learn, and Joe might have done this, and Trey as well, they learned what it took to be a successful artist, not just a successful uh, painter, but also somebody who was working in the art world. And one of my greatest, uh, uh, my greatest loves of him was his recruiting ability with students. He was the best student recruiter that I have ever seen. When I was chair of the art department and I had a prospective student walk into my office, I would call Bruno down and they would be signed up in the twinkling of an eye. He would say to the student, you need to come here and study with me. And voila, they would be enrolled and I would have another student. As you already know, Bruno grew up in San Antonio. After high school, he received a golf scholarship to Texas A&I University in Kingsville. 
There could have been no better choice for Bruno in that moment. Many universities in the United States at that time discouraged Hispanic students from making art that reflected their own heritage. Yet Texas A&I embraced and encouraged those students. And there, not only Bruno, but many other great Hispanic artists found their footing on that campus. Carmen Lomas Garza, Cesar Martinez, and Santa Barraza, to name a few. From there, Bruno attended the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Color really became an artistic obsession for him at the university. He told me that he took the color class, I think it was four or five times, with the same instructor who had been trained under Joseph Albers so that he could memorize the method and carry that on to his students. When he came to the university, uh, we added a color class, which is Design 3, which is still taught to this day by his student, Joe, and other people at the university. Uh, so my students know who Joseph Albers is. I don't have to worry about that part. Bruno arrived in Corpus Christi to teach in 1981 after three years at Stevens College in Columbia, Missouri. This move had a tremendous impact upon his work. He often commented on the uniqueness of the light on the coast. And I'm just brought in here a view of Bolverde, which is actually a, a place in the hill country near San Antonio. Uh, where Bruno had some acreage in his, and I think Joe showed us a picture of him at Belverde, or, or Trey did, and his goal was eventually to retire back in Belverde. Um, unfortunately, he was not able to do so. But one of the things he commented on about Corpus was the uniqueness of the light on the coast. I hope my little picture kind of gives you a sense of how that is different from other lo locales and locations. It changed his art and it brought him full center to the brilliant color for which he is so well known. He began also to build a cadre of students who were interested in painting. Then in the mid 90s, he began working closely with two of his former students, Betty Mobley, whose work you can see here, and Michael Lathrop, whose work you can see here all dating from the same time. There was great excitement in the air as New York City was talking about a new school of painting, the Corpus Christi School. John Driscoll gave us hopes that that title would stick and find its way into the art history books. Well, all of the art history books haven't been written yet, so if it's not there yet, we'll get it there eventually. Bruno's work was widely known in New York for many years after this time. And in fact, as you know, Joe told you about his working in New York at the MB Modern Gal Gallery. The MB stands for Mike and Bruno. It was a wonderful name. And eventually, um, the rigors of running a gallery, I think, became enough for him to decide to come back to Corpus Christi and teach again. And that's when Louis Newman, I believe, took over the galleries. Images like Happily Ever After show you the best of the Corpus Christi school and the best of Bruno. The vivid colors are situated in such a manner that they work brilliantly together. Rich blues, vibrant reds, and energetic yellows create a visual realm where peace and nature coexist. Bordered by a halo of pink flowers against an orange field, the dynamic radiance awakens the senses to enjoyment of the world around us. His work also reflects a particular dedication to hard work and experimentation. He got into printmaking for a, a, a time period 
And in this serigraph, Passion to Stay, Bruno translates his painted visions into a printed work of equal verve and visual appeal. The potted plant, solid but flat, hovers over a radiant field of blue that converges table to the tabletop with the sky. Reds and blues compete visually with each other, drawing our eyes repeatedly across the image. It is hard to know where the eyes should land for a rest. Another aspect of Bruno's paintings is that they are joyous. The colors and the titles tell us so. To your joy reflects the passion in Bruno's heart's heart and his hopes for happiness for everyone who was close to him. He often told me he prayed at night for his closest friends, and I was in, in those prayers often. And there are so many dimensions to this painting, so many visual tricks from earlier artists, the local color of Pierre Bonnard, the complexity of color and pattern of Henri Matisse, and the visceral approach to the landscape of Richard Diebenkorn. Once again, where does the eye alight? It wa wanders incessantly over the bravura brushstrokes in the luminous glass vase. Reflection upon reflection illuminates reflection and a deepening embrace of the world. And what could be more engaging than that I adore? Once again, the complexities of color, movement, and juxtaposition of patterns ignites a visual field with unending possibilities. The, worst, the reverse perspective of the bright red tablecloth brings the flowers into our own, our own world. The brushwork is a little lighter here, a little more evident, but remains a strong builder of the composition. Flowers echo off the surface of the image in an array of possibilities. This intimate image, part of the plan, uses the framing organic border etched with flowers, as almost a frame to the landscape within. Rolling hills of green lead off into the infinite, but also upward, in alignment with the red tree on the left, which provides us with a visual anchor on the left side of the painting. A great work of art makes one wonder and contemplate which I believe happens here and which happens in all of the other works by Bruno. In 2007, I curated a show of images on the theme of the Virgin of Guadalupe entitled Visioning the Virgin. Uh, it was about representations of the Virgen in uh, South Texas. So I was looking at artists from this region and how their expression of the mother of the Americas would be. And one of the artists I included in that was Bruno with a slightly different painting than the one that we see here, which was done the year after um, I had the exhibition. Maybe it was inspired by it. Bruno provided us with a unique expression of the Virgen de Guadalupe whose image can be seen here in the Santuario de Guadalupe in Mexico City. Bruno removed the central icon of the Virgin and instead focused, focused on representing the mandorla that existed around her. The field of radiant red is covered with stars and the roses discovered during her apparitions to Juan Diego. The yellow and red here together generate a vibrancy 
that is intensified by the fields of blues and purple, energized by the pointillistic dots. An image worthy of veneration is the result of this tour de force of color. Some of my best days at the university were spent with this great artist and this great friend. I miss him every day. I think of him often. Sometimes I want to call him on the phone and tell him what's going on. Because <laughs> we used to talk a lot on the phone. I think of his big sense of humor and his big heart. I think also of his hands full of color and his deep knowledge of art and art history. I think of the many times that I sat with him in graduate committees, listening to his great advice to students. He had a wealth of information that came from years of deep study and consistent artistic practice. He just had a litany of images in his head that he could spout out to students and inspire them to make themselves better artists. Today, I imagine him in the afterlife, telling his creators jokes while he paints a beautiful work of creation. Bruno's best days were spent at the easel with his son and in the classroom. Bruno left a tremendous heritage in his wake his son, Trey, his successor in painting at a and Corpus Christi, Joe Pena, and so many more artists out there that I can't even list every single name who were inspired by his work or touched by his teaching. Thank you for allowing me to share these thoughts with you. May your best days be ahead of you as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Terry Rote, for that interesting and illuminating lecture. I also appreciate the title of your presentation, The Nature of Color, which will be flipped to The Color of Nature. Uh -huh. Before we look at question and answer, as well as comments regarding these lectures, I want to recommend two, two books. Yes, yes. The first by Dr. Driscoll. Bruno Andrade, The Nature I Paint. And the second, which features the mother of the Americas, a book on contemporary art written by yours truly. Both of these books can be purchased in our store physically and online. Jose, do we have any questions? Or would anybody like to make comments? Um, yeah, we actually have a question here for Professor, for professor Joe Peña. And let me see, it's from Nola Guajardo. It says, Joe, can you address his love of mentoring students and his legacy of getting them into good graduate schools where they intern where they in turn are now teaching in colleges and universities sharing his knowledge and artist spirit. Absolutely. Uh, Bruno was uh, adamant about making sure that his students were successful. And, and as much as Kerry had said about bringing the students in, which he did uh, quite regularly with, with, with great success, he was also uh, a, a proponent about getting them back out into the world, into graduate programs all over the country. And, and the continuing that, uh, that inspiration into becoming wonderful teachers, and a number of them which are currently. Um, so he was instrumental in ensuring that he would do that. And so he just had a way of making sure that, that you knew what you had and that you could share that with, uh, with other students, with a new generation of students. And he was always wonderful about making sure to stay in contact with former students as well. And so 
And we would also uh, constantly uh, call him up and say, you know, I'm having a problem with this project. What should I do? And he would say, well, try this or do this, you know. So still sharing his wealth of knowledge um, with his uh, former mentees and to make sure that they be themselves become successful instructors. And so, uh, and then in that turn, those students and then becoming further instructors. Um, and, and inspiration uh, for generations to come. So yes, he was a, a very instrumental in continuing uh, the lineage, if you will, of what a, uh, a strong instructor should be. Awesome, thank you. Uh, we, have, we have another one from Bear Smith. It says, hi everyone, the show has a beautiful flow to it. I was curious if the panel could speak more to the curation process. When did planning begin and how were the works chosen? Is Silvia Orozco there? Uh, she is not. She's okay. Off. Well, if I, can, if I can speak on behalf of the museum, and I will, thank you. Uh, the idea to, to present an exhibition really began with Trey Andrade. Uh, Trey approached several museum venues. And eventually we were approached, thank goodness, we received the show. We had to cherry pick uh, from a vast array of uh, paintings, drawings, prints, uh, educational materials and catalogs and photographs. So it was a daunting and challenging uh, task. Uh, Silvia Rosco and I uh, rolled up our sleeves and dug into the material. We also were assisted by team members in the selection and placement of the, uh, the, uh, the paintings and the rest of the artworks. Trey, can you speak further about the exhibition and how you proposed it? Sure, yeah, I actually, I have a, a picture I'd like to share. As, this is uh, <laughs> Sylvia and I in the storage unit. Um, after my father passed away in 2013, there was this, uh, Joe was there to help, thank you Joe. There was a task of taking all of the work and consolidating it into one location. So we, um, he had a storage unit currently and then he had works in his home and uh, we took them all and put them in a truck and drove them to Austin um, where I was um, gonna be living and uh, put them in a unit there. So the works had been there for several years and I was talking to Sylvia about the show and this is a photo of us finally um, going to the unit, pulling everything out, pulling all the work out. I think we filled the entire floor at that storage unit. Uh, other people were showing up. I go, I'm sorry, let me just move this over. And uh, we got the opportunity to look at all the works and um, here's the two of us going through a portfolio. Um, so I continued to work with Sylvia after this for several months and um, she chose works from um, the estate here. And then also I recommended some other collectors that I knew had a lot of his work in Corpus Christi. Um, one of the notable ones who was a huge uh, contribution was Tinker, uh, Tinker Floyd. Um, she's in Corpus Christi and um, she owns uh, an, uh, an appliance store. And uh, it's actually a funny story. My dad came in one day to buy a refrigerator or something, and they started talking. And he told her, "Hey, I'm a, I'm a, I make these big paintings. You could use some big paintings in here. You should come over to my house and you should see the work." And she said, "Oh, okay." And she she loved them. You know, she saw these huge, beautiful, colorful paintings, and she loved his work. And she, I think, owns maybe close to 15, you know, large paintings. And so a lot of the work in the show uh, came from Tinker and um, to kind of fill in the gaps. I, I wanted to be able to represent from, you know, the 80s to the 2000s uh, as a retrospective. So I, I had a lot of older works, which I, I thought was great to share. And then she had a lot of the newer pieces um, as well, so. If I may continue, I also uh, attended the University of Michigan at the same time that Bruno was there. 
He was an incoming graduate art student at the University of Michigan. And I was uh, finishing up my undergraduate uh, studies in the art department. We became fast friends. I want to uh, relate back to the comment made about A and I, uh, who, uh, that encouraged uh, Mexican American students to uh, record and interpret their Mexican American experience. By contrast, at the University of Michigan, we students were highly discouraged uh, to pursue that, fault, that particular path. We were encouraged instead to look at uh, current um, trends such as abstract expressionism. I followed that route as did others there, especially Bruno Andrade. So uh, I, when I was invited to participate in this show as a guest curator, now a, a permanent fixture in the museum, <laughs> Uh, I, I took a great interest in making sure that he, this particular historical period at the University of Michigan was, uh, flat, was uh, fully developed, um, and we did so. But as we evolve through the show, you'll see, if you could visit it, you'll see that he goes from these uh, plain, somewhat stark black and white gray colors uh, to low color tones and then a burst, an explosion of color. As an abstract colorist, you'll, you really can appreciate uh, Bruno Andrade's uh, identity, an American landscape painter, a Chicano painter, uh, a native painter, but most importantly, I want to emphasize that he was an abstract uh, colorist. And when you walk into the museum, there is just this uh, vibrancy that where you see these colors uh, and you feel the colors vibrate. Jose, any other questions or comments? Um, yeah, we got a comment here. Let me see. Uh, it says from anonymous, and this is this is actually one that that I think uh, I and Dr. Rodriguez have also just kind of ponder on and uh, reflect on frequently. And one that I like to talk about when I give tours at the little, like when my friends come and see the, see the exhibit, because right now we don't have schools coming in to do tours. So, um, and it says, did Bruno see himself as a Chicano artist? Could I address that? Yeah. Please, Carrie. Because we talked about it. Um, and I don't think he saw himself a hundred, I mean, he, yes, he was Hispanic, but he also wanted his art to go beyond that. Does that make sense? So he wanted it, he didn't want to be labeled Chicano. Um, he wanted it to be more universal. And I think he did kind of take a different trajectory than some other H Hispanic or Chicano artists, yes. as far as iconography and style. Um, that elu uh, elucidate that. So. Yes, in the exhibition, we have one example in which Bruno explores Chicano iconography uh, called Aztec Eagle, but that's a very rare instance in which he does that. As mentioned, we were all encouraged to pursue more a world perspective uh, in, in our artwork as we are experimenting as students with color and form and different uh, influences. Uh, continuing with what Carrie had mentioned here, um, we, had, we were friends and then there was a, a break in our friendship as we took different paths in our careers. When I was hired at uh, a &M University in Kingsville, I became aware of Bruno teaching at Corpus Christi, so we rekindled our friendship. And the first thing he asked me at a party that he hosted at his home, he turned to me and said, asked me, George, am I a Chicano artist? <laughs> and I, and I, re I retorted, Bruno, do you believe you're a Chicano artist? He nodded his head with a grin, looking at me, and I said, well, Therefore, you are a Chicano artist. And so that was a question that had been posed to him uh, by students, by colleagues, uh, by critics. And, and, and again, 
he really didn't want to super uh, underscore that particular identity. He only wanted to make sure that people recognize his Mexican American culture, mm -hmm. part of his heritage. Uh, and yes, he was aware of Diego Rivera and the other great uh, Mexican modernists, but he was more in tune with Matisse, Cezanne, um, Hans Hoffman, um, as, as, uh, as great influences. Also, of course, highly inspired by Dr. Rudolf Arnheim, who was mm -hmm. a psychologist at the University of Michigan at that time. Uh, Rudolf Arnheim, a, uh, a trained Gestalt uh, philosopher and psychologist, uh, whose expertise was the perception of art, which really, really inspired Bruno to start looking at his art in a different way. And at the same time that Arnheim was there, there was a small exhibition of Joseph Albers uh, prints, homage to a square. Mm. And students went to the small exhibition venue uh, and Bruno was there along with the uh, graduate students and so these were the two influences uh, at, on Bruno at that particular time, besides Hoffman and besides his uh, two mentors at the University of Michigan. Jose, any other questions or comments, please? Um, yes, let's see. We have a comment from Sandra Gonzalez that says, I will always be thankful to my late professor, Bruno Andrade. He always pushed me. Thanks to his advice, I went to graduate school at PAFA and had the opportunity to learn about murals. I miss hearing his lectures. Bruno's legacy will always be in our hearts. Thanks to all the panelists. Here's another one from Carl and Christina Halbertier. Uh, it says, glad to be able to see this discussion. I think of Bruno often as he was a mentor to me while at T-A-M-U-C-C, Tamek, I guess. After graduating in 2009, it wasn't until 2014 when I thought able contacting Bruno after so many years. My wife is an artist too. I wanted her to meet Bruno. Sadly, I learned Bruno had passed the year prior and regret dearly not talking with him one last time. Uh, here's another one from C. Finelli. What were Bruno's top Painting colors of choice. Ah. <laughs> anyone who, anybody want to answer that? Trey, Joe, Carrie. Well, I guess I kept mentioning quite a bit, like the the bright reds and the blues and the yellows. I do know that Bruno worked with these pigments that were very dangerous pigments, mm -hmm. and my mm -hmm. cousin owned. Um, a paint store Herwix in San Antonio and he would actually literally have to drive some paints from San Antonio to Corpus to deliver them to Houston, uh, to, to Bruno. He couldn't just put them in the mail. Um, so I, the technical aspect of the colors is something maybe Joe would know better than I would. But like I said, I see ma mainly primary colors and then kind of burst of orange and I, I was gonna say for if Joe if you could share um, some I think earlier on it maybe near the end of his career it, he was maybe a little more uh, controlled and uh, traditional well, I don't know about traditional but um, maybe in the 90s there was that time period Joe where you were working with him and you were in the garage. If you could speak to a little bit of what you were doing in the garage. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, I, I would I would say that, um, uh, yeah, regarding his uh, his color choice, you know, I think Trey had uh, uh, shown a wonderful image of his relationship to Hans Hoffman. So I think there was a relationship in how that color choice, you know, as Carrie mentioned, maybe a primary, but in as much as Bruno uh, was extremely knowledgeable about color applications. You know, he would at times find that color uh, choice or those color choices and slightly bend the rules you know, to make it work in his favor. Mm -hmm. But in reference to what uh, Trey would be speaking about, I remember some of the earlier days where uh, Bruno wanted to have, um, Bruno wanted to have the colors and whatever they would be on the surface be as vibrant as possible. And he mm -hmm. was, uh, 
and he wanted to make sure that those colors would be vibrant. So he would ask us to uh, he would ask us to uh, apply uh, straight lead white paint mm -hmm. onto the surface, you know. And so uh, he would get these uh, containers, of which I still have a couple, of lead white paint primer uh, from a, a Dan uh, Dan Davis uh, art supplier in New York. And we would uh, we would put on these big hazmat suits, you know. And he was always such a fan <laughs> of uh, of doing it the traditional way, where we would heat up the rabbit skin glue, you know, this mm -hmm. old process that's uh -huh. been around for five hundred years, you know. And we would heat up this rabbit skin glue and apply it onto the surface. And then uh, once that was dry, then we would uh, mix up the uh, the the lead white primer. And, and apply it in numerous coats onto the surface. And between each coat, uh, sand it down to a smooth paper-like surface, apply another coat, sand it down again. And we would do this three or four times, if not more, uh, but resulting in the surface that was glass-like, just exquisite. And you see it in some of the images where you, where you see the control, as I had mentioned earlier as well, uh, in his mark making, when it would be a smooth, uh, almost, a gel-like surface onto it, but then also having that control of those beautiful marks that you would see on there. And so it was wonderful to see uh, how uh, this process, and of course, we would sand between sanding it down, uh, have these, as I mentioned, these hazmat suits, not too much unlike of what we're having to wear nowadays, right? <laughs> but uh, having to apply these uh, in, in these open doors, uh, but to get this wonderful surface, uh, which, was so evident in seeing what uh, the paint would be vibrant on. So yes. Awesome. I think that's what you're referring to, right, Trey? That was it, the, the rabbit skin glue. Rabbit skin glue. <laughs> um, okay, so we have a, another comment here. It says, um, my congrats from Mark Anders Anderson. My Ooh, congratulations yeah. to Trey for putting this ex exhibition together and a hello to my friends on the panel. Good memories. Hi, Mark. Hey, Mark. And now we have, uh, we have Silvia Orozco who just jumped on, back on. I, uh, I'm going to give her the floor a little bit just to see if she wants to kind of dig a little deeper on uh, the, cur the curatorial process. But also I wanted to add to that question. Uh, this is a personal, personal uh, side. A little bit of my question with the past question, which is, uh, how did you, how did you, uh, what made you decide to do a Bruno Andrade exhibit? Uh, I've been working at the museum for a year and a half now, and I've never seen a, a like entire a retrospect of like where we dedicate the whole museum to one artist, and it, it was it, it, it impacted me. Uh, Bruno definitely influenced me in the short period that we've had the exhibit, which was. Uh, what since I think about June-ish. So I want to ask Sylvia that as well. Like what made you decide, Bruno, how did you find out about Bruno? And uh, yeah. Well, uh, during our, we're going to be uh, 37 years this year, uh, our anniversary and through our history, uh, we have done uh, several retrospectives or one person exhibitions uh, of Latino artists, Latino ex-artists, mainly because other uh, mainstream organizations have not done that. And specifically, uh, Texas artists, uh, we did an exhibition of the work of Santa Barraza, Fidente Duran, um, Sam Coronado, uh, Jose Trevino, uh, Benito Huerta, uh, Celia uh, Munoz, so we've done several uh, retrospectives, but we haven't hadn't done one uh, in the past few years because uh, we've been mainly concentrating on things from the collection. And so we also uh, also concentrate on artists uh, that are part of our uh, permanent collection. Uh, so when we have an opportunity to show uh, a major artist uh, from Texas, we, uh, we it's very important for us. And so we wanted to spotlight uh, Bruno Andrade specifically because he had there had not been a major retrospective of his work and because we had uh, uh, his his a lot of his work was here and access to a lot of the, the collectors and the generous collectors that lend the work uh, we were able to uh, put the exhibition together so uh, the question was also how did we uh, curate the exhibition 
So when you begin putting together anything that you, you, you do, it's about organization. And it's about organization and seeing uh, themes, seeing uh, images, seeing ideas, concepts that have a, uh, they're being repeated. They're being repeated throughout uh, an artist's uh, uh, history and th through their production. And so we had, as I said, we had access uh, uh, to work that from, from the early years to the, to the later works. So we were able to see all this work and it's about kind of sorting through all of that, those, the, and we basically went through everything, all the work that we had access to, um, hundreds of, of artworks and, and drawings and sketches and, and then the paintings. Uh, and then looking uh, also from, from the collector. So we had a strong uh, example of a lot of the, his, throughout his, his uh, development and career. So once we uh, went through all the artwork, we started, we started seeing uh, things that, uh, artworks that could be sorted into different categories. Of course, we wanted uh, to introduce uh, his early years, his early production, and so we have a whole section on that. The exhibit actually has eight different sections. So we have the early years, and then that goes into then his work of working with nature that we defined it as his more spiritual work because the, the connection that he had with nature. Then the, the next thing was the, the, the constant idea of using the uh, still lives. So the still lives were, were continuing to appear in, throughout his, his career. And so we have a whole section on the still lives. And then the, the idea that South Texas, South Texas was very important to him and that many of the work started with drawings. So we developed a whole section on, on South Texas. And then him as, a, as an educator, that was very, very important. And so, and then the color, so all of those things, the, the basic uh, concepts, the basic things that uh, ideas and images, the icons that he, he worked in, the themes, uh, the, we, that we developed sections on that and Dr. Vargas uh, developed the, the text and, and the, developed the ideas a little bit further and that's how basically uh, the exhibition got together. So it was an, an in-depth look at the artist's production over his career. I'm sure there are other uh, aspects um, and other uh, concepts that he, that he worked on, uh, but within the, uh, the time and breadth and scope that we were able to work in, this is what we uh, came up with. And uh, we're very pleased, we're very pleased because we, we think it gives a very good overview of his production and hopefully the exhibition uh, we'll travel to Corpus and to other museums so that more people can can get uh, to view. And I'm here again at the museum, and I'm so happy that people there's lots of people in the gallery. So you have until uh, August 30th to come by and see the exhibition. And once you're here, you're just going to be you're going to if you have if you're not in love with Bruno's work, you're going to fall in love. So thank you so much. Thank you, Sylvia. And uh, yeah, I mean. Also, just to kind of touch uh, further on that, we are following uh, the, the health protocols that the city has, uh, has developed. So we, if you are gonna visit the show, you are required to wear a mask and we're not taking any cash at the store and things like that. So just to give a heads up, if you guys are planning on visiting, um, our, our um, rules and hours are online. I just posted a link to the exhibition. Um, we did create a, a virtual exhibit where we basically, since we couldn't, we weren't able to have an opening traditionally because of the pandemic, we created a website where we tried to mimic uh, all the elements of the reception. So our team worked really hard, went out of their way. We didn't, we didn't hire any uh, people to come and do those kind of virtual home tours like they do on fancy uh, real estate websites. Like we had to do all that on our own with our cell phones and things like that. And we're really proud of it. I just posted the link for all our panelists and attendees. So uh, yeah, and let's see, we got a few more comments here. Uh, let's see, we got one from another one. Another one from Nola Guajardo that says, Trey, I know you have in common with your dad the desire to paint. 
but knowing your father's work and knowing your style as well, you are very different. What can you say as a major influence uh, that he gave you as a teacher as well, as a close influence? I guess what was like a major influence uh, in your work today that your father gave you? I, I think um, the going back to the beginning of what I had to share is most influential is as a young child, just being in his studio um, and then getting it to see him create these worlds and to see those vibrant colors really push the atmosphere and, and, and make you feel like you're somewhere else. And I think often his works are kind of otherworldly. Um, and so that's something, you know, I'm, I'm interested in maybe a more of a sci-fi um, influence. But um, another thing that really inspired me was getting to see where his works would go. So he would sell a painting to a collector and um, we'd drive off to San Antonio or something and go to this really fancy house. And you know, we're bringing the painting in and we're going to hang it on a wall and just to see the piece amongst some um, incredible architecture and to see that they, they wanted to frame this wall with, with a Bruno piece. I think at a young age that had a really big impact on me as to you can create a painting and then it goes somewhere. It sits somewhere and it lives there for forever. If you know, the painting can outlive you, all of these paintings of his, you know, they outlived him. And, um, I think that was just really impactful, that, that ability that an artist has to create something that lives on uh, as, a, as an artifact. And I, I think that was a big pull for me to want to create and be an artist. Can I add something? Of course. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to also uh, make sure that uh, make sure that everybody knew that uh, uh, Bruno, and as much as he would uh, uh, you know, encourage his students, uh, those the, of us, including Rolando Reina, uh, Manny Chapa, who would work in his studios as his assistant, uh, he would also, uh, we, we wanted a work of Bruno's, you know, we wanted one in our collection, you know, we could never afford it, of course, but we wanted one. So what he would do is that he would allow us to uh, to pay off, pay it paid off, you know, in work time, you know, he wasn't a slave driver, so we would constantly be because, hey, is there anything you need done? Because I want that painting, and so he would actually let us, uh, you know, he would of course drastically re reduce the price, but then allow us to work uh, towards that time to paint off the painting, and I, I have a couple of pieces of those where I would get those uh, paintings and have those. Uh, have those uh, there, but uh, I just wanted to mention that very quickly. So. Awesome, thank you. Let's see another Q and A. It says for Trey, are you happy with the exhibition display? How was it coordinating this during the pandemic? I unfortunately I, I'm living in California, so I haven't got to see it. But I've, I've I thank you. Uh, Mario and, and everyone for creating all the material. So I've been able to see it virtually and be able to move through the space and it, it looks great, it looks fantastic. Um, a, lo a lot of great work over months. And um, yeah, I, I, oh, and one thing Sylvia kind of pointed out that um, I, I thought was really interesting is going through the unit she found a lot of drawings and then finding drawings that correlate to the paintings in the show <clears throat> so I, right there um she had sent me some pictures and so that she found the drawing for that painting i thought that was exciting to get to see um all of those connections coming together across the show and i guess maybe i could also relate that one to to sylvia uh how was coordinating this exhibit during the pandemic well, we were supposed to open on April the, the 10th, and uh, so I think we were uh, mandated to stay home, so we were at home, but um, 
we, we got to come back, I think in late April, and I, ke I kept thinking of ideas, how we could go to the storage unit, you know, cause we were supposed to be like sheltered in place. And I thought, uh, cause the, the storage unit is close to an HEB. And I, I, told, I, I told one of my staff members, I said, what if we go park at HEB? And people will think we're shopping and we could sneak over to the storage unit and they won't know we're working. And then <laughs> we looked at each other, no, I think we, that's not a good idea. Okay, so, so we, we followed all the rules and uh, we came back when we, we were able to, able to, the city allowed us to, but we didn't open to the public till May the, the 26th. So we did everything, you know, legally and we did work, we were back in the museum when we were allowed but we, to work on the installation, to paint the walls, do the design and we coordinated the, uh, the staff, the Mexico uh, team was incredible in that we communicated and we worked, well, we worked more hours than usual, I know, because people would, we would be emailing and texting at late at night and uh, it, it was, it was an, you know, it was quite an, an experience and uh, we, but we were able to do it, the design, the labels, the, the uh, exhibition text and the, a lot of the staff members, they hadn't seen the artwork. They hadn't seen the artwork until you know we we were back at the museum in uh, late uh, late May, and uh, then they did come back till June. So it, it was difficult, but uh, our installation crew, which uh, Andrew Anderson and Savannah Diaz and uh, and Michael Robles, we we worked here just regular hours with our mask and. Um, and regular hours, but it, it was, it was, we were a bit nervous, but we, we did it and uh, we're happy that we did it because we knew that when we were going to be able to open to the public, we were going to have an incredible exhibition and it was going to be a major accomplishment for all our team because it was really a team effort and the collectors, they were so generous in lending us the artwork during these times and uh, it was an incredible experience that I'll never, I'll never forget. But I know that each day when I walk in here and I see the paintings, and I know the same for the public, just like it inspires you. It inspires you and it, it inspires you to, to get up every morning, to, to work hard, and, and you're proud of being part of Mexicarte and part of this exhibition, and proud to have known uh, Bruno, and uh, proud that he is part of our Latino heritage and Latino art. And, I don't know, I, it's, it was worth it. It's an incredible exhibition. I would do it all over again, <laughs> pandemic or no pandemic. <laughs> oh, I think Dr. Vargas has something to say here. To, to, Go ahead, Dr. Vargas. Yes, to comment on following uh, Sylvia's um, perspective, uh, very proud to say that we were the first uh, art museum to open its doors this Bruno Andrade exhibition. And so that really demonstrates our courage, our dedication to meeting the challenge of putting together an exhibition, opening our doors to the public during this pandemic. Yeah, yeah, and of course we, we had to do a whole bunch of changes and to our systems and just to follow the safety regulations of all that, um, but I have a, I guess I've, there's, there's a few more questions here, but just since I have Sylvia here, and because every time uh, when I go with my staff members, we go get coffee or something, and yeah, like you don't get tired of seeing them every day and walking through the gallery, and every now and then we'll, we'll like just curiously ask each other, like which, which is your favorite piece of, of all the Bruno ones, because there's so many. So I guess, uh, you know, and you don't have to answer Sylvia, because I know it's like asking a parent, like who's your favorite kid, but <laughs> Do you have a favorite Bruno piece that we're, that's on exhibit right now, Sylvia? Well, all the, I like each and every artwork for a different reason. I mean, I even love the drawings. Um, and, but I, I wanted to say also that I believe that this exhibition uh, is kind of full circle and it was almost like destiny because uh, Trey was here in Austin uh, we had a, a past staff member, uh, Oscar Guerra, who actually introduced us. I want to thank Oscar, recognize him for introducing us to Trey, who then you know, brought the exhibition possibility to us. 
And then also then Dr. Uh, George Vargas, who, who knew Bruno in, in college, who you know has his artwork on his book and included in his book, Contemporary Chicano Art. And first he was as a, as a as a, our, uh, invited curator, and then he now is part of our staff. So I think it's like full circle. And then he had some of his original artwork from the 70s that represent his, his, his ideas and thinking about you know, him as a Chicano artist, which is a very, very important piece. So I, it's kind of like full circle. It was meant to be. And uh, I'm just glad that we had this opportunity again to show the exhibition. But I love all the artworks. and. Um, I just like, uh, just like you said, Jose, just like, they're not my children, but I love, I love all of them. Yeah, okay. So here we have a comment from, thank you very much, Sylvia. Uh, here we have a comment from Carla that's, uh, that says, thank you to the Mexico Art Museum for collaborating with my son, Trey, to make this exhibit happen. Uh, thank you to George, Joe, and Carrie for sharing their expertise and memories of Bruno. Trey, you have made your dad proud. <laughs> um, all right, so we have a few more here coming up on the end of this. Um, here we have from Auntie M. It was an honor for me to see Trey, my nephew, and Bruno's show yesterday at the Mexicarte mm -hmm. Museum. Took my breath away uh, at all the history and beauty from two amazing men. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez and Silvia. It was lovely to meet you. Thank you, Auntie M. Uh, and then we have one from uh, Anderson, A. Anderson. For Trey, it was a great honor and privilege handling your father's work, and thank you for sharing this wonderful collection with the Austin community. Trey, are you still making work? If you are, I look forward to handling your work someday at the museum. Just realize this is Andrew Anderson, and uh, he is our, our preparator at the museum. So, Trey, would you like to respond? Uh -huh. I've been uh, <clears throat> I've uh, been busy uh, working. Um, I started a new job um, a year, about a year and a half ago, um, which has been really, again, full circle. Um, an engineer of color process for um, Shiseido is a cosmetics company, and um, we're creating technology that involves color and um, custom products. So it's been a real learning experience, but it's been great to be able to combine this kind of problem solving of these real world applications with this history of color um, that I was able to take from, from my dad. And I was able to take his course and then also teach color. And so it's, it's, um, uh, that's what I've been busy with lately. Uh, not, not so much painting. It's also uh, very expensive here and I'm in a very small apartment. And as <laughs> I, I can't get out the oils, I think I'd pass out. So, um, but maybe, maybe one day soon. Okay, so I guess that is it for questions. Any reflections, comments? I, I'd, I'd like to ask a question, Jose, if I may. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Joe? Professor Joe, uh, regarding your uh, quotations from different uh, art critics, yes, there was one that I'd like you to respond to, as well as to the others on the panel, where one of the critics, uh, Mr. James, or Jamie James, uh, uh, talked about Bruno and uh, compared uh, Bruno's uh, Bruno to uh, Matisse as well as talking about his color palette, comparing it to, um, or inspired or influenced or reflective of the gaudy colors of a Mexican border town. Right. I never would have thought that. I would never thought that Bruno was influenced by uh, Mexican uh, gaudy folk art, primitive art, naive art. Um, can you comment on that? Because I, as I said, I would have never used those kind of labels or titles. Sometimes uh, those may conjure up different uh, connotations. 
Sure, I'd be more than happy to. Um, no, and I, I understand what you're saying. I, you know, it, it can have a negative connotation, um, but you also have to think about the time frame that uh, and the location of where the works were mm -hmm. being exhibited. You know, this was in New York, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, everything was gray. You know, everything mm -hmm. is gray there. Mm -hmm. um, dark colors kind of ruled. You know, and uh, to have a uh, to have the gallery uh, all of a sudden having these bright, vivid powerful paintings mm -hmm. on display you know it was um you could see that it, it would kind of register as a shock uh, for some critics you know and so so in as much as i, I could see the the kind of negative uh, element associated with that term bruno didn't mind it and neither did uh, his good friend and the former gallery mm -hmm. director john driscoll mm -hmm. you know john as i had mentioned i love that quote because um and included it in his book uh, but uh, i love that quote because it was uh, unabashedly um, uh, pertaining to that kind of certain element of, of its locale. And so I don't think Bruno uh, saw it as a negative uh, association. I don't think uh, John certainly didn't uh, either. And so uh, I think they would have had a great laugh about it, you know. And so, uh, plus also, I don't think there were too many um, critics who were kind of venturing down to South Texas, if you will, <laughs> uh, and maybe not necessarily knowing uh, what they would be referring to in in relationship to the context of the location and color sure so i bring it up because i recall in my experience as a student at the university of michigan art school santos martinez who was a, a chicano artist from texas at the same time that bruno was there along with felipe reyes uh, several of his teachers looked at uh, martinez's work and said oh those use of colors we would expect that from uh, a, a chicano and the same thing was said about my use of colors. My colors were not derived from a gaudy Mexican border town. My colors were derived from Albers, from Hoffman, from other sources uh, in the world of, of art history. Sure. Well, there's certain expectations sometimes with, uh, with an artist if you are of different ethnic background than, say, a Europe, Anglo-European artist. And I just wanted to make comment on that. Oh, that makes sense. Absolutely. Any other comments or questions, especially from our panelists? Sylvia, did you find your favorite piece? <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, oh, the one, oh, well, I do like this a lot, this painting that is here, <laughs> <laughs> because I, I love the colors, the use of the, uh, uh, opposites, the complementary colors of blues and the oranges, and the way that he uses a pointillism. And like what you were saying, uh, Trey, the drawing, I think that was so cool that we found the drawings with, for the paintings. And actually this drawing, we originally it, we had put it in the other gallery, and then all of a sudden I said, Wait, that's the sketch for the, for the painting. And so we, we, and then I think Savannah had to remat it because we, we found the, the drawing for this painting and then we found the drawing for this one and we put them together. So um, it's very interesting how they're so little. They're very little, like, you know, five inches by six inches. And then the paintings are gigantic. And uh, so I have many, many favorite paintings. <laughs> yes, <laughs> many favorite paintings. Awesome an important um, point that we really tried to underscore with our, mu our museum goers. That is, we wanted to look at the process by which an, any artist, especially uh, Bruno Andrade, was using uh, by which to, to make art. Um, there is a, a process that all artists use, and Bruno especially uh, was very involved in a very intricate detailed process by which he created these works. Uh, one of my favorite paintings uh, is a large uh, piece of still life, Live a Love, which also includes or features a drawing, uh, a preparatory drawing. There we go. Now we see it again. As a study to make this very large, very well executed, successful painting. It has all those elements that any art historian 
um, could explain. But more important, these works of art are geared for the common person, the masses, so to speak. They don't speak above, uh, above them, but they speak, they speak directly to you, to your heart and to your soul. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I don't know, I guess this is a, a question that, um, for our topic, since we're down to our last 10 minutes, I want to open it to the, to the panel. Uh, because I think what impacted me personally as a, an artist and as a museum staff, as an educator as well, I relate to a lot of, a lot of uh, Bruno's same, being a Chicano, Mexican American, um, and just finding that identity, I feel like looking mm -hmm. at his whole artistic journey, mm -hmm. um, I think it is very interesting, especially when, like we were saying that in Dr. Vargas's book, he ends up becoming the cover of contemporary Chicano mm -hmm. art, um, which I think is interesting. And at first, at first, I, I thought I was, I, I thought maybe just like he questioned his whole artistic career, like, okay, like, like how or why is this Chicano art? Is it simply because um, Mexican American makes it, a Chicano makes it? Mm -hmm. But I think um, I now that we're coming to a, to a close of the uh, of the exhibition, I think the most important message that that I learned from Bruno was that because uh, as Dr. Vargas had mentioned, he he would because they were friends in college and colleagues, he would constantly go to Dr. Vargas and tell him like you know like am I a Chicano artist now like. Like, do, do you think the community accepts me now? Because uh, I think he had mentioned that, like, people, the, the community in the 70s was kind of, like, very hardcore and, like, nah, if you're not, if you're not painting the struggle and the pain, like, then you're not a Chicano artist. And so I think that was the most important message that I took from Bruno's entire uh, career and portfolio and artistic journey was that uh, uh, do... Is it important, especially in a time like today, where there's a lot of uh, division and a lot of uh, hostility raci racially? Um, is it? I, I think it's it's very important to spotlight and showcase other dimensions of Chicano art that aren't explicitly about the struggle and the pain, because I think we forget that. Uh, you know, as Chicanos, we also like to sit at a beach and enjoy nature and draw and sketch from that, you know, and, and I think I, I also like to think that maybe that's what made his work more universal and accessible to across races, across, uh, across genres, like uh, Dr. Carey was saying earlier, he didn't want to be boxed in. And I think that focusing on something that was more general, like nature, right, everyone, everyone can Universally, we can all relate on loving nature. We're a part of it. So I think, uh, what do you guys think? Is it important to, to, to spotlight rare identities in Chicano art, such as Bruno, that aren't necessarily hyper laser focused on the struggle? We'll open it up to everyone here. I think it's vitally important to show those different aspects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not everybody's a cookie cutter. Everybody has their right. own perception. So. Right. Yeah, I'm going to echo what uh, uh, Dr. Rode had said so well. And, you know, Bruno wanted to see his work so much more uh, than being labeled. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was certainly far more than, than, uh, than merely that. Mm hmm it was in, it was international the work is international it's uh it's universal yes yes as uh, important as the question is what is chicano art and who is a chicano artist on another level we need to ask what is american art and who is mm -hmm. an artist? Mm -hmm. exactly this art this art this art expresses american landscape painting but more so it unifies with a world art history perspective. Th these contributions are unified with world art. Yes. Very true. George, may I quickly interject? Uh, 
Oh, by all means. Uh, very quickly, I'm looking at the chat box over here, and, the, and uh, my good friend and one of Bruno's former uh, assistants as well, uh, Rolando Reina, chimed in. Oh, and going sure. back to your initial question of what you had said about the Gaudi palette, uh, and Rolando here states, I think Gaudi is being used to interpret color as toxic mm -hmm. visually and hallucinating to the vision. Mm -hmm. and so and I just wanted to uh, very quickly uh, comment about that because I think he's right as well. Yes, and I know uh, Mr. Reyna's work, a fantastic artist, great teacher, and mm -hmm. has a color pal palette that is quite gaudy as well. <laughs> Being influenced by the master artist, the master educator, Bruno Andrade. That's right. There's, there's the painting there on the left is uh, when I was a child, I put the little red dots oh. uh, uh, down there on the bottom. That's the one, the little red. <laughs> <dot>. <laughs> Easter eggs, uh, fun facts that we can tell people. <laughs> I was gonna follow up uh, Mario on what you were saying about uh, Bruno being a Chicano artist and um, as a parallel between him and one of his um, main influences, Matisse, um, mm -hmm. had a very, um, you know, he had a difficult life. And, um, but despite that, he made these beautiful paintings. Mm -hmm. uh, he decided not to paint the struggles, but instead to paint the beauty. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and, and also a, a strong tie through that is also a spirituality. Yeah. Uh, so that, that kind of combination of beauty and the spirit I think there's two things that Bruno and Matisse really share. Yeah, and, and again, I agree. It's like, uh, it's a dimension that is also uh, needed, you know? Like, we, we also need to show that, you know, the experience is in all pain and struggle. Like, there's also beauty, reflection, finding yourself spiritually through nature. Uh, and I think that's, that's what really uh, made me fall in love with Bruno's art. Mm -hmm the more I see it, especially this piece right here with the boats. Can, can we see that one? Uh, I, I felt like at first, it was one of the ones I liked the least. I was like, ah, it, it looks very like, it, different from all his other pieces, but over mm -hmm. time, because it's at the door that, that leads to our offices, I feel like it became one of my favorites over time, just because, of, um, you know, uh, it's corpus. I've, I've never been, but I feel like it makes me, it's one of the ones that's more uh, as abstract, and expressionist as his work was, I feel like this one was one of the ones that would mostly transport me to the nature of what I imagine Corpus to be like, because <laughs> I've never been. But uh, yeah, I, I really like that boat one. Uh, well, well, come down on Wednesday and you can see what hurricanes do. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, we're already getting some rains from them right now. Uh, here we have a question from Kate. Uh, I guess it'll be our last one, and it says, "What is Trey's favorite piece of Bruno's?" <laughs> oh boy! Well, oh, if you could go back. Oh well, there's the table. That's a good one too. But take to the left. Where the, um, where the boats are? Oh, out of this room. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, oh, the question is actually from Oscar via Kate. Oh, keep going. <laughs> keep going. Go to the left. Left, left. That one, straight ahead. Um, oh, over down. Down. Yeah. So this piece, I had never seen it before. And when I was going through the storage unit, I pulled it out. And I don't know if it's my favorite, but it's, to me, the most bizarre. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> and if, if you are able to be with this painting, you can see that the paint is very, very thick mm -hmm. to the point where it seems like it would just rip off. I, I don't know how this canvas has stayed on there for so many years. <laughs> it's clearly an older piece, I'd say probably from the set from the 70s. Mm -hmm. um, it's extremely heavy because there's got to be, I don't know, 50 layers of paint on there. Um, I'm not sure what it is. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I'm looking at. Is it a creature? Um, is it is, is it a tabletop? It's it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so when I, oh yeah, so it almost looks like a serpent's head and then um, it's, it's, it's a mystery. So the, you know, this, this is a piece where I could probably just stare at it for, for hours and hours. Um, and it was really a surprise to find it. 
I just put a note there. It reminds me of Jose Luis Cuevas. Mm -hmm. Oh, Nola said that it's from the 80s and he was reading Carl Jung and he painted a dream. Oh. oh. Thank you, Nola. Oh. Yes, all his pieces speak at different levels. And I think that's uh, very important to emphasize that all good art will speak to, um, to the viewer at different levels depending on their experience of life. Definitely. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and put up the, the link to the virtual exhibit where you can get a very, very high quality close up look to almost every single piece that we that we're exhibiting. Um, I put it up earlier, but I just <clears throat> put it on the chat again. Um, you know, as as we have a message from Carla here that says, thank you for walking us through the show. I was so sorry that I could not attend because of the COVID virus. And again, like Sylvia said, we put so much work into this exhibit that we even extended the period because we knew that traffic and visit was was low because of the pandemic. But ultimately, the goal was that we put it in the eyes of as many people as we can. And so the virtual exhibit, the link is, of course, not anywhere near as being there in person, but we tried our best to at least uh, give more accessibility to Bruno's work and the retrospective, the original research that was done by Dr. Vargas and contributed by everyone else. So I went ahead and put up the link. And Dr. Vargas, if you want to give a closing statement or. Well, I want to thank everybody that uh, participated in our first uh, ever virtual panel lectures. Uh, especially, I want to thank uh, Mario for putting together the Zoom package. And Jose as well. Uh, you should all know that Jose and Nikki, uh, the other education associate, have developed a whole array of educational activities that focus in on Bruno's art. So please, by all means, if you have children uh, in your family, uh, you might want to look at his art activities. Thank you. And you'll find those on the website too, on the exhibit as well. So. Thank you one and all, and especially thank, we want to thank our, our, our viewers. Yes. Thank you guys. Thank you. Guys, have a great day. Enjoy the week. Joe. Stay safe. Mary. Thank you. Thank you all. Ciao. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Wonderful. Bye. Bye-bye.